Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to share the presentation that I made at the National Conference of Maxillofacial Surgeons last year, 2021, on non-surgical correction of vertical maxillary excess with TADS and microimplants, its biomechanical perspectives and clinical outcome. We do realize that over the years, uh, the treatment planning has become um, much more conservative. Lots of people uh, don't opt for surgical options and would search for a non-surgical correction of their skeletal problems. Now, not every problem can be treated non-surgically, but a large variety of these problems can actually be treated, treated with tabs and bone screws. And that's the purpose of this presentation. Now, uh, if you look at this girl, we can see that at any date, uh, most of the people would have thought about treating this girl uh, surgically because it's a case of frank vertical maxillary excess with a gummy smile of 11 to 12 millimeters. But then we treated it non-surgically. Now, the paradigm change has been there over the years where lots of uh, borderline cases, lots of severe cases, uh, if they are within the biologic limits, can be treated non-surgically by tabs and bone screws. Therefore, have, you, have your patients ever denied to take a surgical option? The answer is probably yes for every clinician. When we see severe cases, we give them surgical options and not many people would love to come under the knife. We know that orthognathic surgery can give fabulous results, uh, but then uh, you know the benefit uh, uh, to the risk uh, factors associated with it is a deterring factor for taking up such elective forms of surgery. Now, uh, all these borderline cases and severe cases, if analyzed well, can now be treated with tads and bone screws. That's the purpose of this presentation. Now, we know that the role of mini implants in camouflage of vertical maxillary excess or gummy smile uh, is something uh, which has uh, uh, brought out a great change uh, uh, to the treatment protocols that we use to correct these problems nowadays. Uh, not many uh, people would opt for surgical options these days, and most of the people would go ahead with a conservative approach. Although this uh, approach is uh, a bit slow, uh, but uh, gives predictable results in the hands of an experienced clinician. And therefore, uh, this presentation would uh, be quite helpful to people who are new to this. Now, uh, the, the concept of IZC and BSS and, uh, and TADS uh, was put forward by, uh, uh, from 1998 uh, and uh, became popular in the late uh, 2008, 2009. And now we have had experience of over the years to uh, predictably say that these uh, forms of treatment are very predictable and therefore uh, can be uh, used by uh, orthodontists to give uh, uh, more than acceptable results. So let us look into the biology first, take care of the envelope. Okay, that's the limitation for biologic tooth movement. We know that acid orthodontics can give certain amount of movement to the teeth uh, the, within the uh, barriers uh, of the bone, uh, the bony boundaries, basically. Now, when we look into uh, the orthodontics plus dentofacial orthopedics, uh, which is like uh, mandibular, uh, like use of functional appliances or headgears, it can give a better, much more, uh, greater results. But when we talk about the skeletal anchorage systems, as you can see in this diagram, it has encroached the areas of, uh, of surgical intervention. And so much so that almost 80 to 90% of our cases which were going for surgery at uh, the one point of time, severe cases have now come down to 10, 15%. Uh, that's a great change. And therefore we are able to deliver results uh, much more predictably uh, with the advent of these mini screws. You also have to understand that maxilla is more compliant to camouflage than the mandible, and therefore the maxillary movements are much more easier uh, done than mandibular movements. Uh, that's a sign of an experienced clinician who knows uh, what his boundaries of treatment are. Uh, not every case uh, can be treated non-surgically, and not every treat can be, cases can be treated with uh, tabs and bone screws. So we need to uh, get a fine balance uh, out of experience as to which case is probably a suitable case for these forms of treatment. Now, what is this vertical maxillary excess treatment all about? It's about, uh, the, you know, it's like LeFort 1 osteotomy. Uh, so you need to understand that in this case, uh, it's about a slow LeFort 1. So what does it require? 
it required a synergistic effect of the TANS, that is the uh, you know, maximum intrusion. The third one are extractions because they act as terminal hinge and prevent the counterclockwise rotation of the mandible and clenching exercises. The third one tends to be ignored grossly, but that's uh, very, very important for maintenance uh, and uh, to prevent relapse or whatever you are achieving with orthodontic tooth movement. And this uh, article is being very popularly quoted uh, by, uh, uh, by not, which was uh, published, by, published by none other than Chiolo Pike on molar intrusion using TADS, the key element to correcting anterior open bite and vertical excess problems. So we know that uh, it is a combination of all these effects that actually give the final results. Now, when we look into animations, uh, we talk about uh, the, a topic called as orthodontic surgery, like orthodontics, which is popularized by KJ Lee. And uh, what does it actually say? It, uh, it actually, uh, it is something which happens uh, uh, with maxillofacial surgery, that is Lee one osteotomy, when we lift up the maxillary segment, we do a maxillary full arch intrusion. Now that can be done uh, with the tabs also nowadays. Uh, controlling the mandibular dentition is very, very important because when we lift up the maxillary dentition, uh, there is uh, probably extrusion of the mandibular dentition that might happen. So you need to control the mandibular dentition and you need to take care of the third molar hinge, which is very, very important to bring about uh, gross uh, auto rotation of the mandible. So therefore, when three things uh, mix together, then you are able to get results close to default one osteotomy. Now, if you look into this case, uh, I will go uh, quickly through these cases. Uh, now, this is a girl who presents with uh, severe vertical maxillary excess uh, and gummy smile, and uh, her front teeth was actually broken, Ellis class two fracture, uh, and had a root canal done for his uh, for her front teeth also. Uh, and that is because you know uh, trauma is a very common uh, factor which we uh, see in cases of uh, patients who have proclined incisors. Now, she didn't have a relevant medical history. Now, uh, you see that on the first picture, uh, you have a lot of incisal show at rest. That is quite an indication for understanding that you need to uh, intrude uh, the maxillary dentition quite a bit because about two mm, one to two mm of incisal show at rest is probably normal, but uh, eight, nine, 10 millimeters of uh, incisal show uh, is about proclination of teeth and uh, also about uh, vertical problems uh, that is uh, lying within. Uh, now, when she smiles, then everything gets exposed, and then you can see that she has presence with a huge gummy smile. So we are looking at uh, a vertical problem, uh, which is borderline surgical. A lot of patients uh, uh, and clinicians uh, might think that surgery would be the best option, but let us look through this case. Now, you have a gummy smile and proclination of incisors in this case. You also have posterior gumminess. That's something which needs to be addressed because in leaf one osteotomy, uh, you tend to lift up the posterior and the anteriors. Uh, so uh, if you are doing something which replicates the leaf one osteotomy, you have to effectively intrude the posterior teeth as well as the anterior teeth also. Uh, if you see the profile picture, you can understand that there is a huge convexity in profile and uh, you have a retro chin. But uh, that's basically because, uh, you know, downward, downward growth of the maxilla, this maxillary excess has caused a clockwise rotation of the, of the mandibular plane, leading to increased convexity. Now, if you are treating this case just like a bimaxillary protrusion, then you're not going to get good results, okay? Uh, you know, the lip uh, morphology and uh, the lip competency that you expect at the end of the day is not going to correct. So you're looking at something much more aggressive, okay, uh, in order to get a better result. So you have posterior gummy smile and a convex facial profile. If you look into uh, the intraoral pictures, you will be able to understand that it's a case of bimaxillary protrusion with deep overbite, overbite. And you have the uh, anterior front two teeth, which are, uh, which are RC treated, uh, uh, probably because of a trauma and uh, the pulp becoming non-vital over a span of time. Uh, no crowns were given uh, for this teeth uh, uh, at this point of time uh, by the clinician uh, initially. Now, uh, the problem with uh, intruding, uh, significant amount of intrusion for anterior teeth uh, is root resorption. But if it is controlled well, uh, we hardly do get uh, such, uh, uh, such complexities. But uh, in root canal treated teeth, you have to be even more cautious. Now, uh, there is a problem with deep bite and you have uh, two anteriors which are root canal treated. Apart from that, it's a case of bimaxillary protrusion. 
So if you look into the uh, into the Maxley arch, you can understand that the front two teeth are RC treated. Uh, you have proclination of the upper incisors. You have a constricted maxillary arch, and you have dental hygiene, which is not too great because she has multiple dental caries. If you look into the the lower arch, you will find that the lower incisors are flared, they're crowded. Uh, there is a lot of uh, irregularity of teeth, uh, as well as dental caries, which shows that her oral hygiene and motivation for oral hygiene is probably not great. So if, when we took an uh, X-ray, the OPG, uh, we understood that the root canal is done pretty well. But then if you want to bring about gross inclusion of the anterior teeth, uh, you have to be overtly cautious uh, about these two teeth particularly. Uh, the, the terminal hinge is present, probably the third molar is there. So uh, one of the concepts is elimination of the third molar uh, could give uh, better results. But then uh, we uh, go into a much more conservative stance. Uh, we try to intrude the maxillary segment and the mandibular segment. And if you see that auto rotation is not happening, and then we opt for thermonar extraction. But uh, if you ask us uh, which is the best way to go forward, yes, uh, uh, thermonar ex uh, extraction would be, a, would be a great option. But at some point of time, what happens in bimaxillary protrusion cases is that you're already extracting four premolars. And then an eight teeth extraction is probably uh, not something uh, which is great to happen to a patient. So if we find that response is not there with respect to auto rotation of the mandible, then we tend to extract or wait till that point of time. Uh, so you can go through this article, which we have written in schedule anchorage mediated slow auto rotation of the mandible, orthognathic surgery like orthodontics for correction of vertical maxillary axis in one of the university journals uh, to get into details about the uh, biomechanics, which we are anyway going to describe here. So you have two incisors which are compromised. Uh, you have the third molars which are present and in occlusion. Now, if you look into uh, uh, the decision whether to extract a third molar or not, uh, that's something very, very tricky. Most of the clinicians uh, uh, would advise you a third molar extraction. But then when you're looking at a conservative approach and mostly when you are into private practice, uh, it's essential that uh, uh, you uh, do things uh, uh, which are uh, aggressive uh, only when it is mandatorily required. So uh, we believe in this concept, like if uh, the third molar is impacted, for example, uh, so it does not provide any terminal hinge uh, or prevent auto rotation of the mandible. So don't, just don't extract if they are not uh, symptomatic. Okay, if there's no pain, no need to extract them. Now, if auto rotation is happening uh, and the teeth are in uh, the third molars are in occlusion, then you can delay the process of uh, extraction because anyway the the biomechanics is uh, is responding and, and the patient is uh, getting a lot of improvement. So we can hold on to this third molar extraction until that point of time where uh, that is posing a problem to us. Yes, auto rotation is not happening. Uh, and you're not getting the response, the biomechanics is not working only because the third molar is in occlusion, then you have to go for extraction of another uh, four third molars. Uh, that's something uh, which is left uh, personally to the choice of the clinician. So if we look into the cephalometry, you find out that uh, the composite analysis showed that it's a case of a bimaxillary protrusion where the upper and lower incisors are typically very, very proclined. You have the third molars in occlusion. Uh, you have a profile which is uh, which is very, very procumbent. You have a chin, which is retrognathic. Uh, and, so, and you have a vertical dental height, which is uh, uh, both increased uh, anteriorly and posteriorly. So if you look into the analysis, you find that it's uh, typically A and B of four degrees, which shows that it's a class two skeletal base, uh, even though it's a bimaxillary protrusion, just because of the of the profile that, uh, and just because of the you know vertical maxillary excess, which has caused uh, uh, the, the mandible to rotate uh, clockwise and backwards. You have an IMPA which is really high. Uh, you have an FMA which shows that there is a vertical maxillary excess. You also have a nasolabial angle which is uh, which which is probably higher because of the nose stepped up a bit. But the most important thing uh, that you need to summarize out, out of this cephalometric analysis is that it's a class two skeletal base. It's a vertical growth pattern. It's proclined upper incisors. It's proclined lower incisors and a convex facial profile. Now, a patient presents with a gummy smile also. So you have a maxillary anterior dental height, which is about 41 mm, mm and you have a maxillary anterior uh, posterior dental height, which is about 24 millimeters. Uh, so both of them are high. Uh, that's actually the cause uh, for the facial features that you are seeing in this patient. 
So what do we do? You know, uh, that's the planning. The planning is extraction of one, four, two, four, three, four, and four, four. That, that is because we are treating a severe biomax reproduction case. And we plan to intrude and retract for correction of gummy smiles, okay? And, and you want to effectively intrude the posterior teeth also, uh, which would cause autorotation of the mandible, uh, which would uh, uh, account a clockwise autorotation, which would help in improving the chin prominence. We might require a bit of proximal stripping in the lower anteriors because there is a Bolton excess in them. So uh, if you want to go through and read up specifically about these forms of treatment, this article in the seminars in author on this is probably a great idea. Uh, so it, it is by KJ Lee on advanced biomechanics for total arch movement and non-surgical uh, treatment for hyperdivergent faces. So uh, that's one uh, must read that I would uh, suggest you. Now, what's the appliance of choice? It could be any appliance, so long as you are uh, completely uh, perfect with the, with the biomechanical perspectives of dealing with the appliance. So we used a, a passive cell ligation appliance, uh, uh, which is a standard talk bracket. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, treating biomax reproduction, it helps to use standard talk brackets because you are uh, looking at, uh, basically at controlled tipping of teeth. Uh, rather than uh, effectively using a 22 degree torque, uh, I prefer using a standard torque in, in such, uh, such cases where the upper and the lower incisors are severely proclined. So rest all is, uh, is all same. Uh, that's for the maxillary arch uh, torque consideration. Mandibular arch is all same. Uh, like any other MBT appliance, it's about minus six degrees uh, for the lower, lower anteriors. So uh, going ahead with the wire sequence, which uh, I usually uh, preferred in this case, that's about 016 night eye, 45 days, about two months for 018 SS, uh, then you go into a 1925 night eye, but our working arch wire is 1925 SS. For all these teeth movement that we are looking into, uh, the most important perspective, the most important perspective is to have a controlled movement. Uh, you don't want uh, all this, uh, the, your biomechanics to fail just because your wire is undersized. Uh, there's a lot of uh, forces which are being applied to all the teeth uh, at this point of time to bring about orthodontic surgery like orthodontic results. So your wires and your base hardware has to be rigid. Uh, otherwise you will end up getting a lot of side effects. Now, something like your molars rolling in, your palatal cusps hanging and such a lot of things which you really want, don't want at any point of time during the course of treatment. The lower arch uh, is uh, regular retraction. Uh, uh, if at all uh, you see extrusion happening in the lower and you feel they can add on to a mini implant, a couple of mini implants to hold the lower posteriors and prevent them from extruding. Uh, we usually use the crimpable hooks uh, with the 1925 SS for getting the intrusion and the retraction process. So that's what we are using. Uh, we are using, uh, you have to understand that we have banded and bonded up from second molar to second molar. That's very, very important, okay? Uh, because you cannot leave the second molar, okay? Because it has to be a part of the intrusion process. Uh, we have placed uh, one uh, screw in the anteriors. That's a strategy uh, for, a, for a patient uh, who, uh, where, you know, the bracket system is uh, having uh, a less amount of torque. So that's about 14 degrees torque. It's not 22 degrees. So if you're using a 22 degree torque, uh, you know, the teeth are automatically having adequate torque. In that case, I would prefer two mini implants distal to the lateral incisors. But when you are having uh, a torque which is less because you want a bit of control tipping to happen, then a single mini implant is better because it causes that intrusion and a bit of flaring or a bit of addition of the torque during the process and makes your life much more easier. So here we have used a one. We have not added, added mini implants in the lower because the response was fabulous during the course of the treatment that we were doing and we were not having any negative side effects. Uh, this. So um, it's just uh, that every appointment visit is very, very important because you really need to know what's happening on your patients. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, let's not overdo stuff, okay? Uh, but uh, if, uh, you cannot miss out on the intricacies of this matter because as it is, it's a very technique sensitive process and you don't want to miss out on things uh, by patients missing out on appointments. So I make it a point that they are very, very sincere with appointments whenever they're undergoing such uh, major tooth movements. Uh, so the next thing is we, we place mini implants on either side, uh, that's between five and six and one in the center. 
And you also need to see that the height of the mini implant in the anterior is adequate. So you need to check out the amount of gummy spine that you want to correct. And I check the amount of gummy spine uh, uh, to be corrected. And then I add on another two millimeters uh, the, uh, to place the mini implant that much higher. Okay, because otherwise you the shifting of the mini implants after you have corrected a bit of gummy spine is uh, is something uh, which is uh, uh, which is difficult for uh, for patients. Okay, you have to you have to be very kind on your patients uh, patients too. So uh, so what you do is that you add on uh, you check the amount of gummy spine to be corrected and then you add on two millimeters and then you place it uh, place the anterior mini So uh, then this is the biomechanical perspectives in details. Uh, so your working arch is a nineteen twenty five stainless steel. Uh, your net. Uh, uh, your mini implants that you're using is 1.5 into 8 millimeters. That's more than enough. You don't require IZC in this case. Okay. And your net effect is intrusion of the whole arch and retraction of the anterior segment. Right. Uh, the forces has to be at a very, very optimum. Okay. For you to intrude and retract and see to that, that you are also treating uh, the healthy teeth. Uh, you don't add extra forces in the anteriors and cause root disruption, specifically in this case when uh, they are already root canal treated. So uh, that's the trajectory of force that we are uh, we are using. So that's uh, the posteriors with, with this trajectory would cause retraction of the anteriors, but it would cause intrusion of the posteriors. That's what you want. Uh, but as an effect of the this trajectory of force, you get a get an extrusion of the anteriors, which actually you don't want because that would increase the gummy spine. Therefore, you have another screw placed in the anteriors so that they can counteract this movement or overcome this uh, uh, this extrusive component and bring about true intrusion. So that's what you're looking at. So it's a combination of understanding uh, the positive and the negative side effects of each trajectory of forces. So the retraction is probably with a 180 to 200 grams of force. The intrusion, uh, that uh, the amount of force that we give is 80 to 90 grams for the whole anterior segment. So it's about uh, 15 to 20 grams of force per teeth uh, is exactly what we are looking at. And retraction uh, you know, unilaterally, we give this much amount of 180 to 200 grams of force. So keep that force very, very optimum, uh, nothing more, nothing less. So uh, let's discuss now about a, singly, a single mini implant and, 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 and two mini, mini implants being placed. So as I told you that uh, if your incisors are retroclined or if you're using a, a, a torque bracket, which is, uh, which is standard torque, which is not the ideal MBT torque of plus 22 degrees, because you want uh, retraction, uh, retraction and controlled tipping of incisors because it's a severe bimax protrusion case. In that case, I would prefer a single mini screw in the anteriors uh, because that would cause anterior intrusion and a bit of flaring of the, of the incisors, which is like addition of a bit of torque. Uh, and then uh, I can overcome that uh, the deficiency of the torque and which will help me close extraction spaces also. But if you are uh, using a normal MBT system uh, and you really don't want control tipping of incisors, in that case, what happens is that if you're using a single mini implant, you cause a lot of flaring of the incisors because you automatically have plus 22 degree in your incisors and then you are using a single mini implant and that's a bit of a bit of an issue. In that case, uh, if you have chosen the appliance uh, of plus 22 degree, you can preferably use two mini implants in the anteriors distal to the lateral incisor or mesial to the canine, okay? To give the amount of force which we should bring about mostly true anterior intrusion and the flaring effect would be less. So you need to understand these diagrams really well uh, before you execute it on your patients. Otherwise, you know, the results uh, might turn out to be suboptimal. So on the parental side, this is the, uh, the what we discussed in the buckle side. The parental side, there is a big issue. Okay, now uh, you can use a TPA. Okay, uh, in order to prevent uh, the palatal roding of uh, palatal cusp roding. Okay, that's because when you're using such a lot of uh, intrusive forces in the buckle area, what happens is that uh, you know the palatal cusp tend to hang down, and once the palatal cusp hangs down. Then your occlusion is happening with the functional cusp uh, uh, palatal only. So you're not getting true intrusion of the posteriors. Okay, that's a bit of an issue because unless and until you bodily intrude the molars, okay, what happens is that uh, the terminal hinge will never be eliminated. Okay, the occlusal interference will never be eliminated, and you will never get counterclockwise rotation of the mandible, which is your primary objective in this case. So therefore, you have to take care of the fact that uh, your palatal cusps 
of any teeth are not rolling uh, down. Uh, that can be negated, uh, that can be observed also. You needn't place a mini screw in the palate instantly. But then if you're seeing something like this that is happening, you can use a, a, a modified transparental system, which is kept about five millimeters away from the palate. And then you can start activating, uh, giving forces uh, from the mini implant placed in the palate. Okay, however, in this case, it was not required and it was kept under observation and we were not facing any such problems. But this is this is one of the biggest problems that pops up when you are using heavy force in the buccal aspect. So we are enforcing on the fact that you should always keep forces very, very optimum in this in these cases. You also have to understand that whenever the palatal cusp hangs, okay, your primary object, first of all, you cannot have occlusal interferences when you are doing orthodontic treatment. That's a, uh, because you need to take care of the TM joint at some point, uh, at uh, all points of time in life. Uh, the other thing that happens is that your primary objective of uh, getting a true impaction of the maxillary segment is actually not happening. So you, so, uh, you know, you are not landing anywhere. So you need to take care of this perspective. So uh, as the treatment progressed, okay, we got a beautiful uh, occlusion at the end of the day, okay? Uh, it's class one molars, class one canines, ideal overjet, overbite, uh, deep bite was also taken care of significantly. Uh, the, we added on uh, uh, the uh, a couple of crowns to the, the, to the anteriors. Uh, we wanted to give a, a, the all ceramic crown, but then patient off for a metal ceramic one. Uh, so the, the objectives of the orthodontic treatment was uh, finished intraorally. But here we are looking at facial improvements. We are not uh, bothered too much about the uh, about the occlusion as such, uh, which is uh, supposed to be good at the end of orthodontic treatment. So, uh, if you see the see the occlusal perspective is well aligned, the arches have widened up. Okay, we have got a good arch form. Uh, we have advised the patient to go ahead and do this uh, uh, filling for dental caries okay, and restorations. Okay, One of them were restored, but then uh, uh, it's left up to the patient to decide when he wants it for himself or herself. Uh, then you have a lingual uh, bonded retainer placed uh, in the anterior segment uh, for, for both the cases. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty well done. Okay. Uh, but uh, let us see uh, the facial impact because uh, uh, all these surgical cases, the most important thing that you need to get, get is a good facial outcome. Uh, that's what uh, defines uh, the, or justifies you orthodontics doing orthodontics instead of a surgery. So you see the smiley stitches in this case is beautiful. Okay, the gummy smile is completely gone and the lip incompetency at rest and all these things have been taken care of. So the profile looks beautiful. Okay, it, it's uh, it's the convexity of the profile has gone. You have got counterclockwise rotation of the mandible. The chin has become more prominent and is as good as it gets. And there is no posterior gumminess also, as you can see in this picture. Okay, that's very very important in order to maintain the stability of the results which you're getting uh, during the initial years of orthodontic treatment. So that's uh, a great improvement. Uh, if you check on the post-op OPG, uh, we still have advised the patient to go ahead and extract the third molars, which were not extracted because we were anyway getting good autorotation of the mandible. But then for maintenance, uh, then also for retention of these results achieved is very important that you extract the third molars. Okay, then when you have given adequate uh, results to the patient, one good advantage that happens is that they tend to uh, listen to most of the things that you say afterwards. Uh, so the RC treated tooth had no, absolutely no root disruption. That's great whenever you have intruded by such a lot of, uh, it's about seven, eight millimeters of intrusion, which you have done to correct gummy smile. It's uh, it's great that your RC treated tooth responded very well. It's, uh, it's something which is uh, very good to see at the end of the treatment. Uh, but that's all happened due to giving light forces that you should always remember. So uh, the post uh, the surgical, uh, the post uh, uh, you know, orthodontic treatment, you see that the retraction of the incisors have been done uh, quite well. Uh, so you got good inclination of the upper and the lower teeth uh, and the profile looks beautiful at the end of the day. Uh, no root is option, a good amount of intrusion of the maxillary component that happened. Uh, we're going to share it with you uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, that's uh, and, and very heartening to see that such severe cases of uh, orthognathic surgery can be treated, treated with orthodont orthodontics nowadays. So the next thing is uh, the analysis after treatment. The analysis shows that your ANB angle has reduced. Uh, your IMP has greatly improved. Uh, that's expected out after orthodontics. The FMA has closed down, okay, from 27 to 25. That's great to see because your chin prominence and closure of 
uh, of lips at rest can only happen when the lower facial height has reduced. If your lower facial height has not reduced during the course of orthodontic treatment, then it is uh, the results will never be like this. And once the results is not never like this, okay, you are always kept uh, kept on thinking in your mind whether that surgical option which you opted out was actually justified or not. Uh, so you need to be very very. Uh, uh, very, very cautious about these forms of treatment in your initial years after having done for years now. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a benefit for us, the experience. Uh, but then whenever you're doing it uh, in initial years, if you are cautious, and once you get a grip of uh, this, uh, correcting these problems in such methods, okay, uh, the, the paradigm of treating uh, such skeletal problems uh, drastically increases. So uh, at the end of the day, it's still a mild to uh, class two tendency. Uh, it's an automatic facial profile, though uh, the camouflage of skeletal class two was done uh, pretty well. The gummy smile is grossly reduced, as is evident from the maxillary anterior dental height of 28, which was 42 initially, and maxillary posterior dental height of 22, which was way high than this before. So unless and until you lift the maxillary and the uh, maxillary segment, both anteriorly and posteriorly, uh, things are not going to be stable over the years and your results will not be of this uh, uh, this quality. So that's how we progress uh, from biomaxillary protrusion uh, to, uh, to uh, extraction of premolars and doing intrusion retraction and then closure of spaces and then finally getting a, a beautiful result at the end of the day. So uh, the, this is how we uh, we, we finish the case. Uh, it's, a, it's a gummy smile correction case and then we told you where to use the midline screw and where to use two screws in the anteriors. Uh, the, that's uh, the, a take home message for you. And you should remember it whenever you're choosing the appliance. Uh, your whole planning should be done way before you have uh, put on the first bracket. Uh, that's very important. So uh, now these are the progress. So you can see the lip incompetency at rest was uh, about eight, nine millimeters to start with. And then uh, the face looks completely different at the end of the day. It looks much more shorter, okay? The lower anterior facial height is reduced. The lip incompetence is completely uh, gone. Uh, uh, she has a very balanced face as of now. So inside the sh uh, show at rest is improved. The other thing that is there is that the huge gummy smile has been taken care of, both anterior and posterior gummy smiles are taken care of without surgery, okay? That's a, that's a great thing to, uh, to happen for a patient. Uh, so that's taken care of. So the maxi anterior dental height reduced from 41 to 28. That's, that's a huge amount of, uh, of improvement that you are expecting. So uh, from the side, you have posterior gumminess, which is very difficult to treat, okay? Because unless and until you are using suitable mechanics, what happens is that you get good anterior intrusion, but less posterior intrusion. Uh, and that point of time, you're getting a bit of open bite and stuff and your uh, profile doesn't look great. So that's, uh, uh, that's the objective uh, of the 45 degree view. Uh, so you have a posterior dental height, uh, which has reduced by about two, three millimeters. Now, if you see the profile, that's very important to see, okay? Because you see the chin prominence, that's the most important part of your profile, okay? The NAPOG line. Uh, so you see the lips have been retracted well, that's fine. But you have a chin throat angle, which is far better now. Now, that, that is actually our, the, the success that we are looking at. So if you get a maxillary impaction done, uh, that's the amount of change that you get. You get uh, max uh, gummy spine correction. Not only that, your profile improves because you have a counterclockwise rotation. So what's the difference between the two is that something which happens in a single day in the operation table to something which you're doing it for seven, eight months without surgery. So that's the difference. Okay, the results look almost similar to me these days. So uh, the final comparison, pre and post uh, comparison of CEPH shows that you have a severely proclined upper and lower incisors to start with and which has been corrected beautifully at the end of the day. Uh, and you got a lot of intrusion of the anterior and the posterior segment. Okay, uh, you can easily see uh, the upper incisor and understand that uh, how close is, is it to the NF line. Uh, and that's the palatal plane that we are talking about. Uh, okay, so that is uh, the visible in the, in the CEPH itself, apart from the confirmatory uh, uh, readings that we found out in the lateral uh, cephalogram. And the very the very important perspective which people miss out on is those clenching exercises and the retention aspects. As you can see that in this uh, in this case, 
uh, no, as suggested by Park, uh, okay, you can keep on the mini screws and keep those active forces back inside the mouth as retentive components. But as we're treating Indian patients, and uh, sometimes that's not a, a great idea to do so because they don't tend to come back for regular checkups. But this is a, a, a beautiful idea. You, can, you know, it's like uh, putting an SX from molar to molar, okay, and then telling the patient to eat one meal a day with the SX on. Okay, this encroaches on the freeway space. It gives vertical forces on the anteriors as well as the as well as the posteriors because you are uh, doing clenching exercises with it when you're eating. Okay. Uh, and we tell the patient that you change these retainers once in a year or so. Okay, just one meal a day with it, and you are able to retain things well. See, retaining, uh, you know, closed spaces, retaining uh, something with Holly's appliance or A6 is uh, way too easier, but retaining these cases where, where they are complex and the inherent growth is vertical uh, is very, very important uh, for the long run. So uh, this is one thing which I want you to enforce on, retention of vertical problems by using... Uh, uh, using uh, uh, full coverage uh, SX retainer in the posteriors and eating with it. Okay, uh, that's one thing. The retention is the key. So if you can go through these uh, these articles which are written by us on biomechanical perspectives and correction of gummy smile and vertical max ray access, that would be a great. Uh, 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 you'll be able to uh, to understand uh, this uh, this presentation way better. So. Now, see what happens is that when we pick, uh, uh, pick up single cases, when we pick up uh, the single choice of presentations, okay, and it's an isolated case report. An isolated case report can always turn out good. But then always people ask us is that, is, some, is this something very, very predictable which happens every time that you are doing it? We nowadays say yes, okay? Because the next uh, the few slides that you're going to see is, uh, is umpty lot of patients who have got treated by similar methods, okay? Whether it's an anterior two screw or a single screw, that's different, but it is to entrust on the fact that, uh, yes, these forms of treatment are predictable on almost all individuals that you are doing it. Uh, it's not uh, like uh, out of the blue moon, one case came out well, okay? If you look at this patient with came, comes with gummy smile, uh, gaps in teeth, uh, uh, and before and after dental braces treatment uh, with the use of mini implants, uh, non-surgically treated, uh, you would be convinced that yes, this is happening. There is another more another patient who comes with severe vertical problem, and you can understand that there is a anterior and posterior gumminess, and at the end of the day, this looks far far better. Okay, similarly with two screws at the back and two screws in front in this case. Uh, in this case, so uh, then we have uh, this. Uh, uh, smile designing and gummy smile, uh, gummy smile corrections, uh, which uh, which happen uh, before and after dental uh, braces treatment. Uh, in in those cases, we uh, we find out that uh, you know what what happens is uh, you have a serious gummy smile in this case with broken incisors, and most of the people are are getting uh, treated by by this method. You also have to. Uh, um, understand that these are anterior and posterior gumminess that we are we are looking into, and when you see anterior and posterior uh, gumminess, okay, uh, then the cases become tend to become much more much more complicated. So we are looking into the third perspective that is uh, correction of gummy smiles on patients who have undergone retreatment with us. You can see the patient is already on braces, so you know the, these patients are completely aware of the fact that. Uh, there is a perspective of uh, of this gummy smile that patients want to get treated. So this was a patient who was already getting treated from somewhere else, and uh, the uh, the treatment as claimed was over, and uh, the doctor wanted to remove the braces. But then the patient came back to us stating that I wanted to treat my gummy smile. I wanted to treat the proclination of the teeth because I still don't look that good. Uh, so therefore, at the end of the day, the most important thing that, that actually happens is that uh, patients are now demanding such forms of treatment. So we again retreated her uh, and treated her gummy smile to the best possible. And you can see the results at the end of the day. So it is a life-changing experience as you can understand. This is another patient who presented to us with more with posterior gumminess rather than with anterior gumminess, a constricted upper arch. And you can see that uh, 
you know, the posterior gum is here in this case, we gave less amount of forces in the anteriors, okay, because we don't want too much amount of anterior intrusion, but we get, gave the trajectory of force here was uh, made vertical mode in the posterior, okay. So therefore you have the posterior lifting which happened far better. So in this case, you can see that when full blown smile is a life changing experience for this patient, as you can see that the posterior gum is completely not there. So in such, uh, such situations, we, uh, we do realize that uh, this is done only with orthodontics and bone screws. So we realize that uh, these are something very, very predictable that is happening in today's world nowadays. So you see another case which has a gummy smile, which has a proclination of upper and lower incisors, as a bit of clouding, which has been predictably treated in the, in the similar this is another patient who is undergoing, has undergone retreatment with us. So you have loads and loads of patients uh, coming and complaining after orthodontic treatment that they are not happy with their teeth because whenever they smile, it seems that their bones tends to become more visible. Their gums are more visible. Uh, the results are not good. Uh, so unless and until you have uh, corrected the architecture of the face, the, the smile is not only about the teeth, it's about lip exposure, okay? Uh, it's about the gums visible, it is about the micro and the macro aesthetic component of it, and patients are very demanding these days. So they tend to come back after orthodontic treatment claiming that I want better results, okay, uh, because uh, I do have gummy smile. And uh, we tend to keep these patients uh, uh, in complete loop. It's like, as they say, okay, is like a lot of people say that, okay, one mm of teeth, uh, gums is visible is good, okay? So it's the, you know, the beauty is a perception, it's not a cookbook aspect. So if you say, if the patient is happy with that one mm of gumminess, we tend to keep it. A lot of patients say that, no, I don't want gumminess at all. I want this amount of teeth to be visible. Okay, so we constantly interact with patients and come to a conclusion about what suits her face and what she is happy with. That's very, very important nowadays to uh, because cosmetic form of treatment is actually an elective form of treatment. If you have elective form of treatment, it, it is... Uh, the person concerned who is taking the elective form of treatment has to be happy. So it uh, the all the although the biomechanical perspectives and and the and and the ideas about an ideal aesthetic smile or that perspective is something which is uh, so vividly written in orthodontic textbooks, something like uh, Sarver's textbook or so. But then when you are executing it on your patients, the most important thing that you should analyze is that whether your patients are happy at the end of the day. So everyone has a has a perception of beauty about his own self. So in this patient, you can see that uh, the upper incisors are visible very less. So uh, uh, that's what she wanted. She wanted that I want less visibility of my upper incisors. So I would have told him that, okay, a bit of less uh, of intrusion would have been better. Okay, so the judgment is based on the fact that what someone feels is suitable for him so long as okay the biology do not get intervened that's where the doctor comes in that okay this much is enough this will not happen beyond this point of time otherwise you will have root resorption all these things comes as a mutual discussion so we would encourage that whenever you're treating cosmetic uh, stuffs something whether orthodontics or something do interact with your patients more of, more often because the more you speak to them the more you understand that what they want and ultimately you want happy patients in your clinics these days so the, this is another patient who presents with a severe gummy spine, a okay, young patient uh, whom we treated uh, by extraction method. You see the huge change uh, in the face that she uh, she got it. So this is an old patient of ours who comes with one of the first cases of gummy smiles that we had treated initially, apart from crowding, she had gummy smile and good amount of rotation of the mandible also took place in this case. We'll probably share it at some point of time with you, the whole case. This is another severe case which was uh, uh, transferred from uh, uh, Chandigarh to us. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of doctors tend to send us cases, seeing our YouTube video videos or seeing our results stating that, okay, this is something uh, which, uh, which uh, you can go there and get treated. So uh, we are privileged that we get a lot of support from, from orthodontists and a lot of support from dentists who send us uh, uh, these cases to get treated under us. So you can see that there's a lot of crowding and there's a lot of gummy smile which is treated pretty pretty well by similar methods. There are another class two div two case where you can see a lot of gummy smile which is uh, there also div twos do have certain because the amount of gummy smile because they have retroclined incisors but this is a frank gumminess and you can see at the end of the day that she is far far better. Uh, this is another retreatment case. Uh, it's sad to see so many retreatments uh, that are happening these days, but then uh, sometimes uh, what happens is that you 
tend to choose your closest doctor uh, uh, and, and to make your life easy, but then it doesn't turn out well. And then you have to search and search and find out someone who can correct all the problems that has come up during the course of orthodontic treatment. So you can see that the upper incisors are almost worn out in this case. Okay, that's because you know lower brackets, lower ceramic brackets were hitting the upper incisors, and she had gumminess, so the crown length was very very less. So after we corrected the gumminess, gummy smile, and all these things, we put her on veneers because the teeth were teeth. The teeth was completely damaged uh, uh, during the course of orthodontic treatment, which she was undergoing in the past. So we tend to uh, get a lot of uh, patients like this. There's a patient okay uh, uh, who had gumminess and spacing, uh, well treated. Uh, okay, uh, she was something uh, someone uh, who came before marriage to get herself groomed up, uh, groomed up because uh, the things were not looking great for her initially. So this is a young patient who had another gumminess and uh, and then we treated her, okay, because you can see her on braces, which means that she was getting treated somewhere else and then she was not happy with the with the gummy smile and that uh, so much amount of gums are visible. Uh, uh, so mother brought her and then we treated her completely with the with similar methods. Another case where spacing and gumminess is a regular case of ours. So we've got a beautiful result at the end of the day with gumminess completely gone. So what is, uh, you know, uh, now that we are completely sure that with a lot of patients getting similar results, the, the best possible thing that could happen uh, uh, with the use of tads and bone screws is that you have somehow eliminated uh, the surgical perspective uh, to a certain extent. Okay, I won't say, still won't say that not every case can be treated non-surgically. But yes, a huge number of cases uh, which we are doing have been treated non-surgically by this method, very predictable. Now, what is the difference between a TAD-based intrusion approach that we are doing and a LeFort one osteotomy? Now, you have to understand that the case selection is the most important criteria for TAD-based intrusion. It is mild to moderate uh, the, uh, severity that we are focused on. If it's a very severe case, kindly go ahead and do a LeFort one osteotomy tell it to your patients that there's something which cannot be done. Okay, you also have to see the limitation. You have to see the distance of the NF line, the palatal plane from the root tape and a lot of assessments that need to be made, which is not a scope of this presentation. It's probably a one day and a two day presentation that we do for these, uh, these cases. Uh, so those analysis has to be done before you select the case that this is a suitable case, which I can treat it by non-surgical method. The duration of the procedure is that it's about eight to 10 months in which you are doing the, apart from orthodontic treatment, which goes on for uh, maybe uh, one and a half years. So the eight to 10 months of that one and a half years time goes for that intrusion retraction process. So the duration of the treatment totally is about 18, 20 months, but then this portion would go ahead for gummy smile correction or uh, intrusion retraction. But in uh, default one osteotomy, it's on the surgical table. It's like a single day, single shot. You get the whole stuff done before you do a pre-surgical orthodontics and a post-surgical orthodontics. That's very essential to get the result also. The area of operation is basically the alveolar bone here, okay? Because you have a cancellous alveolar bone, you're able to move teeth within the limits of the alveolar bone, okay? But in default one osteotomy, the cuts are all given in the basal bone, okay? So the basal cut bone, bone is the area of operation, while here you're dealing with the alveolar bone trough. Predictably less technique sensitive. That's very important, okay? Because uh, you know you need an excellent clinic, uh, the, the maxillofacial surgeon to go to LeFort one, good LeFort one, or a high LeFort one osteotomy, okay? Uh, and something which is uh, and, uh, which comes with a bit of morbidity also. So you need a good clinician to do a LeFort one osteotomy. You you can learn this tear tad based intrusion and the advantage of orthodontics is that if something is going wrong a little bit here and there, they're going to always come back after. Uh, after you have gained the skills from other patients and all out of experience. But uh, default one osteotomy is a single shot, single day process. You either hit or miss. Uh, retention is the same for both. If you expect that uh, retention is something which is less for tad based intrusion, it's not the case. Both require similar forms because the body does not undergo and uh, un uh, understand uh, the process. The body understand that if the muscles are relaxed, Basically, it happens in both methods. So, you it, you know the closing muscles becomes much more uh, much more active. That is, the mesenteria become active when the lower anterior facial height is reduced. Okay, and, and, uh, it's it's reduced. So, it's the muscles. Uh, it's for the muscles. This whole method, whether it be tad based intrusion or LeFort one osteotomy, is for uh, uh, the closing muscles. So, the closing muscles itself act uh, as uh, a retention method. 
uh, because they don't allow the lower anterior facial height to become, uh, you know, more like before. But still, you need that the retention protocols that I mentioned uh, during the course of this presentation. Then you have morbidity. Okay, the morbidity is nil in in that base intrusion. That's where is the trick lies. Okay, it's like. Uh, when you say that you can treat them non-surgically, you have a patient who is willing to undergo the procedure. When we talk about surgical, then there's a lot of question that comes up and all this stuff. And sometimes the morbidity factor also is there, okay, as it's an elective procedure. So that is the difference between, between the two. Uh, I won't say which one is better than the other. It's like it's like two different things altogether when, uh, when you choose a case. That's when you, the case selection is the most important part. So if you if you like these uh, presentation of ours, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, you can just press on the button below. Okay, and subscribe uh, to our channels to see empty lot of presentations that uh, we keep uploading uh, for your uh, uh, for your uh, knowledge uh, and uh, share a lot of cases uh, from our clinical setup. Uh, if you don't want to follow us in Instagram, because that's uh, where we regularly upload uh, the cases, you can do scan, uh, scan up this uh, QR code and understand and go through and uh, follow us uh, to, uh, to know the daily updates of the work that we are doing. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, to uh, the, all the people who have listened to this uh, dinner presentation so that uh, it's, uh, it's we share and we learn more. Okay. Uh, I do uh, listen to a lot of presentations from other speakers who have their YouTube channels. I've gained immensely out of it. I hope uh, you are gaining a little bit uh, from ours too.